Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to another Q and A. Uh, we're live with you on Sunday night. Uh, great to have you along. Now, uh, who, who big are week. You, by the way? I'm Rob. I'm one of the pastors. I've got Liam, the uh, other pastor, here along with us. You can say hello if you want, Liam. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Now, we've had a great service. Uh, hope, hopefully, you got to tune in. We've got a bunch of questions come through already. Um, uh, so. I want to encourage you to keep throwing questions at us. Um, before we get to the questions, though, it was great to hear from Clive and Jenny. Did you yeah, anything how, strike you? Yeah, how, how good was that? Um, I'm lucky to have Clive and Jenny in one of the home groups I'm part of, and it's always an encouragement to hear when people really do make sacrifices and cross cross boundaries and cultures to, to share the good news of Jesus with people. I don't know if you picked up in the interview that little, you know, some people... You know, actually, you know, the, their phrase was lost their lives, but they lost their lives in an area where there was cannibalism mm. um, in that region. And yet, yeah, people still went, yep, these people need to hear about Jesus and went there. So how, how exciting. And, th- and they did. There's churches there and people who love Jesus and praise God. So that's always encouraging to me to hear that sort of before and after of uh, there's a region of uh, Indonesia now where, yeah, there's praise going up to God and there wasn't wasn't before from that part of the world. Yeah, really exciting, really exciting. And and I think for me, doing these interviews, the hardest thing is what ends up on the cutting room floor. So, <laughs> so much to, more to hear from Clive and Jenny. And so if you know them, give them a call. Say, let's sit down, have lunch and talk more about your your stories. You might need to block a weekend aside. There's a lot, there's a lot there. So yeah, many absolutely. Stories. But yeah. well worth the weekend. Absolutely. Um, now, I want to kick straight into questions for us. Um, I've got a whole bunch here. Uh, let's start off with a, a nice short one. Didn't say it was easy, but a nice short one. That's right. Uh, it's this, why didn't Jesus hang around and address the baptism issue? Um, so if you remember from last week, why did he choose to nick off and not address the issue? Yeah, great question. Thank you, whoever that was. Um, so, And that's really from that first verse in Chapter 4. So now Jesus learned the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although it wasn't Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Um, and, and that, again, it's a bit of a transitional passage. That's why we did it in this week, not last week. But it does does cap off um, that last week, because remember last week's passage we saw um, there was a Jew who had an argument with John's disciples mm-hmm. about baptism, about this cleansing issue. Um, so I reckon that's the same thing that's going on here. So there's this, that Jew was probably one of these Pharisees. Um, so stitching all this together, it looks like the Pharisees, who are these super legalistic Jews who were um, opposed to Jesus, opposed to John, they weren't happy about what was going on. It looks they were, they were trying to stir up trouble. They were stirring up some dissension between these two people who are on the same team but doing different things. Mm. John the Baptist baptizing over here with his disciples. Jesus' disciples, not Jesus, interestingly, uh, baptizing over here. And the, even though they were they were pointing, you know, John was said, oh, that's what he said last week, wasn't it? I'm, I'm only interested in pointing to Jesus. But these Pharisees, this group, were stirring up trouble, it seems. Mm. Uh, and and we, we talked about this in home group again. Um, isn't it remarkable? This is Jesus, the Messiah. He's the one that John said I was pointing to. Uh, he's, the, he's the king. He's got himself. And yet he says, I'll go. Mm. He didn't say, and so Jesus, hearing that Jews realized this, sent a message to John saying, hey, cut it out. I'm here now. Nick off, move over. But it was actually Jesus who left. Um, so I, 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 th- I think there's a little glimpse of Jesus' humility there. Um, Jesus, uh, I think we um, see that we, Jesus has a priority on unity, over division, he didn't want this this to grow at all. Um, yep. But it doesn't tell us really any more than that, uh, which is one of the reasons I didn't deal with it so much in the sermon. The other reason is that we had a massive passage. Yeah, yeah, and so, lots of great um, stuff in it. So lots hopefully that's stuff. enough to get you started. But some of these, we we can read what we have here. We can make some educated guesses based on stuff st- stitched together. Mm. But ultimately, sometimes we have to come back and say, look, we just don't have a clear answer. Yeah. Now, and there'll probably be a, a couple of questions. I, I'm predicting it like that. Uh, mm. This one's a bit about the journey and uh, really speaks to me. It's a great question. Uh, it goes like this. I find it fascinating that Jesus is weary from the labor of walking. This leads me to ponder how at times uh, Jesus is also mentally or emotionally weary. Mm. Any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, Jesus' weariness. A, a great question, and it, it highlights Jesus' humanity. So, um, yeah, there's lots of... Uh, all, it's always the Colin Buchanan songs that pop into my head. But um, just the, the fully God, fully man... Uh, this is one I think it, it reminds us of Jesus' humanity. He got tired, he got hungry, he got weary. And numerous times through through Gospels other than this place, we actually see Jesus having very human uh, emotions and feelings and reactions. Um, so actually, uh, a bit later on, just after John the Baptist, well, Jesus got news that John the Baptist had died, uh, and just reminded John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. Uh, he was the first person to be, I guess, martyred. He was the first Christian or follower of Jesus to be killed uh, for following Jesus. And that hit Jesus quite hard, and he actually retreated to a solitary place to pray. And I think that's one of those, yeah, so we we actually see on numerous occasions Jesus uh, getting up before it was dark and leaving or or going away where the crowds can't follow, um, going to get some space, sometimes by himself, sometimes with his disciples, and, and it seems to rest and be recharged and Almost, I'm pretty sure, either almost always or always, prayer is a huge part of that. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we see Jesus getting weary, um, mentally exhausted, spiritually exhausted in the Garden of Gethsemane, mm. you know, the, mm. before before his crucifixion, where he's he, he's crying out to God. He's at the end of his tether, um, and and yeah, you, you just see that. Yeah, this 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 journey, not just not just the crucifixion, but Jesus' life leading up to that was very human. And he he wrestled with all of that. So, mm. um, and I'm reminded a bit of an encouragement. There is, um, we we read later on that uh, we can be encouraged because the one who intercedes for us, Jesus, who pleads on our behalf, he can empathise with our weakness, not because he sinned, but because he actually went through that. You know, when we're weary, when we're tired, uh, when we're stressed, when we're at our end, end of our wits, whatever it might be, actually, we go, actually, yeah, Jesus lived this human life and walked this path. So it's a good to know that as we pray, we pray to one who truly understands what it is to be human. Yeah, there's a great encouragement there, isn't there? Um, now, I've got tons of questions coming through, which We've is got to great. speed up on the answers. So I'm going to speed you up a little bit. Um, now, next one, uh, so quite specific. In verse 25, the woman makes it clear that she is looking for the Messiah to come. Uh, was this a common belief for Samaritans, given their history? What is the significance, if any, that she points it forward to Christ? And even seems uh, that the whole town is invested in this mm. idea. So what's going on there? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, basically, I'm not sure on the specifics of ancient Samaritan culture and whether that was a common view. Although mm. it did seem to be common amongst the Jews and the Samaritans did have access to the Torah, the the Old Testament, they they had that common heritage. So my speculation at this point, my best guess, is that it probably was a pretty common thing. It was a pretty big deal in the Old Testament. Most of God's people, yeah, well, all of God's people were looking forward to the Messiah. Mm. So that wasn't like a you know a secret thing that only a few of the most learned people knew. Um, but it, it is interesting that she brings that up and that that's her answer to things that are getting a bit confusing. She doesn't know what's going on, so she points straight to Messiah. Yeah, um, it was a bit of a, a decoy, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, a bit of a decoy. I, I don't think it's a terribly bad. Uh, but yeah, maybe it's a bit of a decoy. I don't think it was a, ter- you know, pretty confusing for, I reckon, her when she, you know, Jesus is talking about spirit and truth and she's like, whoa. I just came here to draw water. So Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, here's another question. Uh, Nice, simple, yep. length question. Uh, what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? Oh, what does it mean to worship? Now, you could, uh, yeah, nice, simple question. Not, in not one sentence. Sen- in one no. sentence, thanks. <laughs> uh, in one sentence, go and read the thousands of books written about this. Um, yeah, look, I, I think there's there's a couple of things going on here. The spirit one's pretty, pretty clear, uh, and that's it. The, the whole Old Testament was looking forward to this time when there would be a new breed, if you like, of worshippers, a new sort of worshippers. Um, so Ezekiel, we read about, you know, you, you, God's promising a time when in his people, in his worshippers, he'll replace mm-hmm. their hearts of stone with hearts of flesh or replace their hearts of flesh with the spirit. With, with, yeah. um, so he'll, he'll actually make us able to worship him in a real way. Um, so I, I think that's pretty, you know, people who worship in spirit, it's spirit-filled worshippers. I don't think it's particularly... Uh, talking about a, a style of worship or a, a way that oh now I'm worshiping spirit and now I'm not 
Um, that there'll be people who believe different things on that, but I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think that's more about the, the, the this is the Holy Spirit, the, this new era when God's collecting um, new new worshippers to Himself, and in truth, uh, connect it back to to Jesus. Um, you know, Jesus is the truth. I think that's that's one way, very accurate way of reading it. Um, another thing I think that's probably bringing out is this genuineness of the worshippers, not mm-hmm. a it's not a religious thing. It's not a ceremonial thing. No, no. You, you, he wants worshippers who are going to worship in truth in in this genuine thing. So I think that they're both going on. So that's my short little answer. Uh, yep. Way more to read about that, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> you want them to keep reading. So that's a bit of a cop-out, but that's okay. Um, here we go. Uh, another a question kind of around the woman. Um, this is actually the last one that's coming so far, so... Bring them on. Um, is the motivation of the woman to tell the villagers about Jesus based on her joy in knowing that she's met the Messiah, or is it to lift her standing in the community? Uh, do we really know her actual motivation, or are we just guessing? Mm. Yeah, great, great question. And and again, we can only uh, there, there there are things we can stitch together and we can know, and there's some things we just can't know. Although I think in this one. Um, yeah, so rephrase the question, is this woman basically just running in to try and, I don't know, lift herself up as a, ah, oh, lift her standing in a community, mm. or is she trying to do something else? Or is it or is it something else? What can we know about mm. it? Yeah. Um, so I don't think this is a self-serving action by this woman. I, mm. don't, I, I don't think this is her thinking, wow, here's an opportunity for me to use Jesus to benefit myself in in terms of the community, yep. uh, partially just because of the way she behaves before this, she's she's out in the middle of the day, she's hiding. <clears throat> Big pardon. She's not looking for opportunities to draw attention to herself. In fact, she's doing the opposite. She's she's she just wants to slip into a dark hole and no one ever see mm. her again. That's that's why she's there in the middle of the day, not with the other w- women. So I, I don't think she, she, you know, and and if you've got a history uh, with multiple husbands, whether it's as I said, because they've all died, because they all left her, because she left all them. The thing you run into a town shouting is not, I have found a man. You know, you don't you don't run in to this town where you're already, you've got some level of shame saying, I found a man, if you're trying to lift your standing. So she, she, mm. I don't think she's running back in a self-serving way. Um, and and the other the other thing is in verse 29, um, her, her, her comment, come see a man who told me everything I ever did, could this be the Messiah? I just want to notice you know, what she says. She Come and see. So she, she she's not yep. so interested in them saying, hey, come to me and I'll tell you about a man. No, she, she, she draws them instantly and immediately back outside the town. Um, so I don't think we can say 100% that's her motivation, but I th- it seems to be that she's, she's genuine. Uh, she's a true believer. The text tells us there that a bunch of others believed as well. So it seems to be genuine motives. So it's joy, it's excitement, and it's excitement about them meeting Jesus as well, rather than just about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's certainly the the vibe we get from from the way they interact after mm. the crowd interacts after. Uh, you know, first we came because of you, but but now we see in Jesus' yeah, words. For ourself. Um, now uh, another question that's kind of come up, uh, and it, it's I guess some of that application stuff you talked about. Crossing boundaries, barriers. Uh, we, we kind of saw that in Clive and Jenny, and their yep. their work with a group overseas. Mm. Um, uh, I guess to what extent do we respect that culture? Um, how much do we, you know, want to hear that and listen to it? Um, and how much do we want to, I guess, change them? Mm. <clears throat> so you particularly thinking about. Uh, other other ethnic cultures, uh, yeah, maybe yeah, within yeah. that sort of missionary world where you might go in and seek to tell people about Jesus. Never, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's I think that's a question that's really wasn't asked until about fifty years ago, mm. um, and, and now we're I guess we're we're seeing, yeah, the, even this week some of the, the just reminded about the effects of colonization and uh, European coming in to a culture and, and saying, no, no, we, we, this is going to be our culture now. Mm. You will change. You'll be like this. And 
hard for us to, I think it's really important to separate some of those things. Um, so, so I think the first thing we need to be really clear about uh, is what is Christian and what is just my culture. Uh, and, and so we, we see that exemplified in sort of almost silly ways. I've got good friends who spend a lot of time in Africa where there's churches, there's Christians who've been Christians for generations, um, but for them, they wouldn't dream of coming to church without a without a tie on. Um, and I, I can't remember who it was. I feel I like don't know it could if have I've been... ever worn a tie to church. Yeah, well, I got did I have one when I got married? If I did, that was probably the only time I ever wore a tie into this mm. church building. I think it might have been Jenny, but there, 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 I can remember um, uh, someone who'd been a missionary in these tribal cultures and. These people were sort of wearing loincloths. That's all they had. <clears throat> but they'd somehow managed to procure a tie to wear to church, um, to the <laughs> gathering. And, and, and unfortunately, that, that sort of came from a bit of a basis. <clears throat> from a bit of a basis of, um, I guess, Westerners coming in and saying, this is Christian, but to be Christian is to dress like this. Mm, um, mm. So if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to worship God, I don't know whether they said it or just it was how they behave. If you're going to worship God, he's only going to listen to you if you've got a suit and tie on, <clears throat> if you dress and behaved and act like us. Mm. So it's it's really important, and that seems ridiculous to us. Yeah, so it's a really obvious case of, of you know, that's not Christianity, that's mm. your culture. Yeah, but but there's there's – there's so we need to be really careful that if, if we are doing that, we – we're, we're taking the, the Bible, the Jesus stuff to them um, and, and tr- doing our best to separate that from the stuff that we say. And this is what it looks like to live that out mm. um, for, for us in a Western, in a Western context. Yeah, yeah. But I guess uh, at the other, end, other side, we, we don't want to say that any part of their culture is necessarily good no. and that's the, or bad. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's Clive and Jenny going into this mm. ex-cannibal culture. You we don't, don't want to say, say oh, well, that, that's cultural, so it's fine. You know, yeah, that's, that's cultural right. acceptable. Eat away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so uh, absolutely, there, there's, there's parts of every culture, including our culture, um, that has been shaped by a Judeo-Christian heritage, mm. but there's parts of every culture that need to be reformed and changed by the gospel um, and, and we need to recognize that so we don't yep. want to be uh, in one sense we, we want to be super sensitive and saying yeah we um, westerners we, we've we've got a bad history of doing this of co- conflating and putting together I guess colonization and Christianity and, and marrying them too and say you, you've got to take this whole package that's they, we, we've got a bit of it we've got a bad heritage there hmm. so we've got to be careful we've got to be sensitive. But at the same time, the answer is not to say everything is right about your culture. Um, no, no, nothing. We can't say that. Every man-made culture is yep. going to have its issues, and we need to let Jesus correct those. Yeah, great. And, and a great thing to keep thinking about and, and keep reflecting on for us. That was one of the big things we talked about in my home group this week. Was was you know where are we? being unaccepting, even though we're saying we're accepting, just by our behaviour because we expect a certain culture. Yeah. Of people who who come to church, or or that we might even share Jesus with, yeah. so a, a big question to yeah, ask. Big time. Um, now, that's all the questions we've got. I think it's probably a good spot to leave off. Um, but as always, we you know this is all we do all week. We we want to care about you guys. Want you to grow in the Bible. Uh, so keep coming to us with questions. Keep asking them. Uh, we want to encourage you to keep reading through John. Um, but for now, we'll say good night. And we'll uh, see you next time.